dare great things for Christ. Christ calls us to dare great things. In the marketplace, as well as in the mission field, there has never been a time like the present for the spirit of the Catholic entrepreneur. Now is the time for men and women of great courage and great vision to engage our church and our culture. Now is the time to dare great things. And here is your host as we dare great things, Father Nathan Cromley, the president and founder of the St. John leader, Institute. There's the thought of doing great things. There's the hope that what we do will really make an impact in the world. We need to also see the importance of the ordinary and that God does his most extraordinary things when the leader is faithful to ordinary circumstances. This is what St. Joseph shows us in his life as well. Hello, everybody. So glad to be with you. Let's take a look at an astounding facet of the life of Joseph. I'm just so enjoying these talks on St. Joseph. I hope that you are as well. What we, I want to look at in particular today is how, Saint, how ordinary the life of St. Joseph really was, and especially after such an extraordinary beginnings, angels and all kinds of things. All of a sudden, we find Joseph plunged in the ordinary. What do we do when life just seems to go along the way it should? This is a great question. Let's start with a prayer and ask God for his help. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, O Holy Spirit, Father of the poor, illumine the hearts of thy faithful, and enkindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy Spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us in the same Spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through the same Christ, our Lord. Amen. St. Joseph, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so we've gone through some pretty extraordinary things here in the life of St. Joseph. We've seen him with Herod attacking him. We've seen angels waking him up now twice in dreams. Uh, we're going to see a third time the angel comes to him in dreams. We're going to see Kings trying to kill him, wise men bringing him gifts, the Savior being born. This is not, not your ordinary kind of moments in life. But what strikes me is that starting off here in Matthew 2.19 all the way through 2.23, uh, you, things kind of calm down for St. Joseph. It's paralleled, of course, in Luke chapter 2, verses 39 to 40, where you've got the same thing, a, a kind of calming, and it's a calming that will last for a large portion of his life. I just, first of all, want to point out just how smart, so to speak, God's word is, right? Because so for so many of, of you, 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 you listen to the Bible and you hear certain things and teachings about the moral life, but you don't necessarily see how you can apply what it says to your actual life and your spiritual journey. You kind of say to yourself, well, I mean, I know I'm supposed to avoid this and, and gouge my eye out from time to time. I mean, I'm just joking, right? But like, we think about that, that, that line, you know, from if, if your eye offends you, you know, pluck it out. And we say, that's what I'm supposed to do, right? But then like, I don't really see how that touches my life as an individual. And because of that, there's this great divide that I really want to help solve by these, by these talks. Uh, this divide between my spiritual self, my life with God, kind of like my internal heart of hearts, and every other aspect of me. I, that, if I divide the, every other aspect from me, of me from my heart to hearts, what happens is what is typical of most American Christians. And that is that we really don't see how our Christianity and the message of Christ is really supposed to permeate the fabric of our lives. And that's why we actually kind of live lives that are a lot like everybody else. From, I don't know, drinking too much to, uh, I don't know, supporting causes that aren't worthy of support to not voting or to voting in ways that don't have anything to do with Christianity to, you know, yelling at soccer referees. You've got people who go to church on Sundays praising God, and then, man, do they give their kids sports referees a hard time. I can speak of this be having been a referee, by the way. <laughs> so I know what I'm talking about. It's absolutely absurd the way people treat these, these referees. And, and the people that are doing it are good Christians. They're trying to be good Christians. So we, we have all of these aspects of our life where 
we could spend all kinds of money going to business coaching sessions, but, but we don't spend any kind of money at all going on retreat. We could spend hours a day, hours a day, perfecting our skills and sports and athletics, but we say we don't have any time to pray. Now, you know, when I talk with young people, as I do, I'll, I'll say, okay, let's put it up as a big circle on the board, a big pizza pizza, if you want to think of it that way, right? Like a big pizza of time. Now you cut that into 24 slices. So if it helps you, a typical pizza is cut into pieces of eight. So imagine a pizza and how it's typically cut into eight. Now cut each of those eight pieces into three. All right, that sliver of time represents one hour. That's one twenty-fourth of your day, a third of the slice of pizza. Now, if I were to say to you, do you give an hour a day to God by prayer, by love, by going to the church and kneeling in front of him? The answer would be no, I don't have the time. And you say, well, just when are we going to get the time? Because I, you know, if I were to go to heaven, I would say to God, hey, God, everybody would be so happy and they would just come flocking to church if you would just give them one more hour in the day, right? So imagine if I got up in front of the King Kings and I said to him, give them one more hour and they'll all come to church, right? I mean, like you think you'd say, oh my gosh, absolutely, Father Nathan, I'll give them one more hour. Would they give it back to me? I'm like, yes, because they already have 24. So I give them one more, they'll all come back, you know? I think the Lord would say, tell them that if I've given them 24 and they can't figure out how to give me one, they're not going to do it with 25. And just a sad fact of the matter is, I think God is right. And, and, and when I look at that as a shepherd, I'm like, okay, I don't think that everybody's bad people and that we're, you know, and we just have to become more disciplined, et cetera. I think that we have to learn to see the value. And that's what I want to do to dare great things for Christ. I have to see how my greatness coincides with his gospel. And what we want to do at the St. John Institute is show the link. Well, well here there's a great link, right? There, there's God's word showing me concretely things about my own life that I, might, that I would be surprised by. On the one hand, we've seen in the life of St. Joseph so far how God's call has called Joseph into suffering. He's had to leave behind his home city and his own life and flee to Egypt. He's had to be rejected by the innkeeper. He's had to watch his wife give birth to his firstborn son in a stable. He didn't even have the means to provide his son with a proper crib. His son was put into a feeding trough where they put food for the animals. St. Joseph was humiliated in the eyes of men and in the eyes of this world. And yet he demonstrated leadership by rolling in a strength of meekness and then by being resilient underneath these things. Where was Joseph's greatness to be found though? Because we could speak there of his hidden greatness, of his character, but where did Joseph also deliver the goods and step up to his role in society and with his family? Well, I'm here to say that he did that as well. If we take a look at it, it's in fact in the ordinary. It's, it's where Joseph spends most of his life. From the time that he comes back from Egypt to the time that he dies, we know nothing about Joseph's life save that his son stayed behind in Jerusalem and didn't tell him about it. Other than that, we do not know. And therein lies a great secret. The secret that the glory is found in the ordinary. This is a secret every leader needs to sit up and take note of. It's part of God's teaching for our lives. Father Nathan is producing an ongoing source of videos to form, unite, and inspire you and your family. Go to eagleeyeministries.org. That's E-A-G-L-E-E-Y-E ministries.org. And subscribe to Eagle Eye Pro. Subscribe today. Let's take a look at where this is found. We're looking at Matthew chapter 2, verse 19 to 23. And here's how it goes. But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel, for those who sought the child's life are dead. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel, but when he heard that Achilles was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and lived in a city called Nazareth, that what was spoken by the prophets might be fulfilled. 
he shall be called a Nazarene. So it's amazing because uh, in Luke, we have a similar passage. It, it comes from a different angle, but it says this. This is Luke 2, verses 39 and 40. And when they had performed everything according to the law of the Lord, they returned into Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. The quiet years in the life of Joseph. First thing I want to do is, is, is look at how God leads Joseph silently. You've got, you got two ways of God's leading Joseph, and both of them go hand in hand. And take note, this is of importance for every single one of our lives because God who treats Joseph this way also does the same with us. Okay, so this is where I mean, like the, the Bible is concrete, it's real. And so many of you, you, you kind of think, oh no, there's this biblical stuff. Look at how God treats his people, how the, he treats the characters in the Bible. And when you look at them, you'll also see how he treats you. And that way, when you see how he treats them and see how they respond, you're given an indication of what he's expecting for from you too. And the very first thing is that, yes, God treats Joseph in extraordinary ways. You have four times in the Bible where an angel appears to Joseph and warns him. Three times it says it explicitly, and I think you can infer about the fourth. It says, uh, again, this is verse, uh, Matthew chapter 2, verses, verse 22. It says, being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the gift of gifts. So be, he's been warned in a dream three times by angels. I think the fourth time could be by an angel too. So he's, he gets real explicit you know, indications. I would just like to say, lest you get jealous of Joseph, though, that those indications, it's not as if like he's walking around all the time being indicated. He has to wait until critical moments and out of the blue indications are given that rock his world. Joseph has the greatness to let his world be rocked by God. So when God gives him a direct indication, he follows. And he follows at cost to himself. And he follows at cost of not understanding what's going on and of having to go in the darkness to let God lead him. It is not easy to let your life be rocked by God. If it was, many more of you would do so. <laughs> right? It would be so easy. If it was so easy, you'd all be doing it. Right? But the fact is, it's hard to let your lives be rocked by God. I mean, what if God were to call your son to be a priest? Would you let him go? You won't have grandkids. Your family name would stop. And yet it's obvious God's calling your son to be a priest. Your son told you he was being called. Now, what are you going to do? That's a rock of your world. What are you going to do when suddenly, I don't know, someone in your family comes in and says that they have been diagnosed with some sort of disease that's going to require you to take care of them? How do you follow Joseph's being rocked by God? His angel, angels take many shapes, my friends. Angels take the shape sometimes of a direct commandment. You're sitting there and you're saying to yourself, I wish there was something more in my life. I'm listening to Catholic radio because I'm desperately trying to find some meaning in my life greater than myself. Maybe that's also an angel by God coming to say, do not be afraid to open yourselves to the great things God is asking for from you. Whenever God calls directly, it always rocks our world. Look at James, John, Peter, Andrew. They were fishermen. They're out there in their boats. You know, they're, they're literally mending their nets. And our Lord comes and he says, follow me. And you know what they do? They leave their nets and their boats and their father and they follow him. <laughs> Again, you think, we think, oh man, it's so easy. I just wish an angel would come and tell me. If an angel came and tell, told you, would you do it? <laughs> Sometimes it's a lot easier to say, oh, no, no, no angels for me. I'm just doing fine, you know? Every time an angel comes to Joseph, he's got to wake up from sleep and do something, you know? It's so funny. I don't know if an angel ever says, you know what? Finish your sleep, Joseph. <laughs> it must be hard to be St. Joseph, you know? He never got a good night's sleep. He's always been woken up by angels and running around doing stuff, you know? The fact is, God does speak in extraordinary ways to Joseph, and Joseph has the greatness to follow but what's neat about this story of Joseph is that it's not just in great things when God calls, but it's also in the ordinary. Joseph, take a look here. In, in chapter 2, verses 19 to 23, Joseph gets pushed around. Herod dies. So that's the first thing. So it's not just like, oh, and then Joseph decided it was time to go out of Egypt and confront Herod, you know, and like Rocky Balboa, he rises from the mat and he goes towards. This is not what happens. Instead, he has to wait for Herod to die. Herod dies. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream 
in Egypt and said, Rise, take the child and his mother, go to the land of Israel. For those who saw it, the child's life are dead. But if you know the word of the, of the angel, it's not very specific. Go to Israel. Sometimes God is like that, isn't he? He's not very specific. He says, go into business. And then you're like, well, what part of business? What kind of business? Well, I mean, just go into business. You know it was business. You knew that that was it in general, but you weren't quite sure which way. And so then you try to shift careers and you feel terrible about it because I mean, like, how do you shift careers? But, but you're kind of called to do so, right? And he, he has to, look at what Joseph does. He rose, rises, takes a child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. That's verse 21. He fulfills what God told him to do. But now he's got to keep going. But when he heard that Achilles was reigning over Judah in place of Herod, the angel didn't tell him that. He has to hear, listen. He's told things. He has to adjust and pivot. He hears something he doesn't like, and now he has to make his own judgment. No angel tells him. He just surmises what he has to do. And he's not afraid of surmising what he has to do. It's not God who's going to constantly tell you what to do. God tells you sometimes, and maybe, but he always allows you to listen and to make the judgments of your next course and where you have to go. Here Joseph hears that Archelaus was reigning over Judah in place of his father Herod, and he was afraid to go there. And so he is warned in a dream. It's confirmed. And then he goes to Galilee, and he went and lived in the city of Nazareth. Now, Nazareth is a city just like any other. Joseph gets bounced around from, from Nazareth down to Bethlehem, Bethlehem to Egypt, Egypt back to Nazareth. He has to surmise things. He has to move and pivot. He's got to be not afraid of the vagaries of life because God speaks in, even in the vagaries of life, even in things that are difficult and that are dark and kind of murky waters. God is there too. There's an old saying, it goes like this, circumstances are God's sealed orders. God has open orders that he proclaims sometimes in obedience, things we have to do. And then there are some times where he speaks with sealed orders, circumstances. And these two are God's instruments that Joseph teaches us how to read. Father Nathan has founded the St. John Institute, the MBA program that develops students into the leaders of tomorrow by giving them a missionary's heart and an entrepreneur's mind. Visit our website at stjohninstitute.org. Dare great things for Christ. And it's here that we find Joseph really giving us a, a hope for our lives, especially for all of those who feel that our lives are kind of ordinary. You know, it's like, yeah, uh, coming from a, a background myself where I have, I, I have had extraordinary experiences. I mean, I celebrate Holy Mass every day. I hold the body of Christ in my hand. I, I forgive sins. I'm a Catholic priest. I mean, I've been given every power that Jesus Christ has brought to this earth, save one, the power to consecrate a bishop. Only another bishop can consecrate bishops, but every other power under heaven has been given to me. I'm a Catholic priest. I mean, it's really something else being a priest. You get to reconcile sinners. You get to heal the sick. You anoint those in names. You bring supernatural grace into souls on a daily basis. And yet the strange thing about it it might, it might surprise many of you to think about this, you know. But for all the grandeur of things, being a priest is actually very ordinary. Here's why. You don't get to see what happens. And you don't get to feel what goes on. I mean, there might be mystical graces that are given to some. But by and large, the priesthood is lived just like a Christian life is lived. Where you believe despite what you see. And what seems like an ordinary thing is actually, when seen by faith and in the viewpoint of God, extraordinary indeed. I'll take, for example, you know, if, you just, if you look at it, look in the life of St. Joseph here. What is he supposed to do? He's supposed to raise his family. And finally, the extraordinary events seem to stop. If you take a look again at Luke chapter 3, I'm sorry, Luke chapter 2, it's very simple. Verse 40, the child grew, became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Very simple. I mean, the next thing that happens is that they go to the temple. Jesus stays behind. And after that, it says, verse 52, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, period. The next thing, Jesus opens up his ministry in Luke chapter 3. And what about that vast majority of time? Between the time he was 12 and the time he was 30, that's 18 years 
of ordinary, where Jesus grows. What is Joseph's role? Joseph's role is to keep food on the table and to keep guidance for Jesus and to keep stability for his family and to navigate the typical waters of tradition. It's the sunrise and sunset of the song in Fiddler on the Roof, right? Sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset, swiftly flow the years. And, and it's the day in and day out of the ordinary. And to think that God asked Joseph and asked the Virgin Mary and asked his son, Jesus Christ, to fill this world with 30 years of the ordinary. It's astounding. Even if you count the, the, the last 12, say, well, the first 12 were kind of extraordinary. You lump them all together, even though that's not a fair way of counting because it wasn't all 12. But the, the, that the end of the extraordinary events were uh, you know, accounted for in, in Luke 3 and in Matthew chapter 2 come to an end when he's 12. That's still 18 years. I mean, that's a lot longer than what you would think. And that's filled with the ordinary of God, of, of, of a man called to do his duty day in and day out, and God blessing that by giving that duty the, the glory of sustaining the body of Christ. Here we see something that I think is really unsung, and that is that this world does not, is not, does not go around on the shoulders of priests and bishops, okay? Priests and bishops, we're great. I'm a big fan, okay? But what we, we our job to do is to sanctify the people who go out there day in and day out and turn this world in the name of God and whose job it is to confront straight on the challenges that are in front of us from the outside, from evil, and from the inside of sloth and laziness and innovate and change and make this world a better place and then to do it with, by fighting that greatest of all battles, which is called selfishness and not doing it for their own self, but actually doing it for the good of this world. Hats off to the common worker. Hats off to the common person. In other words, who has been given the job of investing, of, of, of selling insurance, the great jobs of running small businesses and working in small businesses. Now, the other day I, I, I ran into a person and he was all kind of like standing there by the side of the road and he was kind of huffing and puffing. And I said, hey, you know, what, what's going on? What are you doing here? And he said, I just carried this water pump from the bottom dock of a family's house all the way to the top of the hill and I put it in the back of the car and we're going to the repair shop. And I realized that this person was huffing and puffing because they had done something that was so small and so trivial and yet so great at the same time. They were actually making this world a better place and replacing a broken pump. And it's a small thing, but the fact is greatness is made of small things. And the, the inventiveness of, 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 uh, that pushes small microscopic scopic improvements that pushes our whole standard of living upwards is not done on the shoulders of, of small people. It takes leaders who are dedicated to what they do to do it well. It takes that inner quality of a sense of a person to say that what I do, I do for the Lord and I do it as his servant. And therefore, no matter how small the task, it has great importance. Joseph every day went out to work and he built homes and he built, put roofs on buildings. And yet that was for what? So that his son, Jesus Christ, could eat. And you could say, well, what, what is the purpose of that? So that his body could be formed. And what's the purpose of that? So that his perfectly formed body could have the merit of carrying the cross and saving the world by his suffering and his sacrifice thereof. It was that perfect body of Christ that saved us on the cross. And Joseph gave him that perfect body by letting him grow in wisdom and in grace. It wasn't just in the physical, but also in the spiritual by allowing him to grow in stature before God and men by teaching him. And I think it's just such a great thing that Jesus willfully was taught by Joseph. He didn't need to be taught by anything. He knew all things. I mean, he's God. He knows all that is there in the infinity of the world. He knows all things with the knowledge of God. And as a human being, even in his human intellect, he was infused, had knowledge of all things given to him. Like it says in St. John, it says he had no need to ask anyone about anyone. He knew what was in the heart of men. Jesus knew all things. He, he, he was perfect. And yet at the same time, he learned 
there was an aspect of his mind that allowed him to learn, and that aspect of his mind was given to Joseph, his father. What a neat thing for everybody who's taken up that incredible vocation called family life to realize that God has hidden his glory behind it, that he has blessed and sanctified that family life. I just, I I talked to someone the other day and, and they said, you know what? There are two types of people in the world. I said, what are those? He said, one is the ordained and the other is the disdained. And I said, what do you mean? And they went on to say that all the ordained people, they get all the credit and the, and the, and the rest of us are just disdained. And I, and I said, well, that's first of all, that's an exaggeration. But at the same time, a lot of people feel that way. They say, God must have called certain people to great things, but he didn't call me to anything except parenthood, except marriage, except a family. And I have to say, be very, very careful about that because when Christ came down into this world to save it, he came into a family. Joseph shows us that true leadership is not just about great decisions. It's about constancy in the small ones. And that this great man who was given this responsibility carried it out on a daily basis in small ways. The extraordinary of God was willed. And this is what the Bible teaches us in so many great ways. If only we read it to our benefit. It was willed to be hidden in the ordinary. 18 years of growth, of quiet, of day in and day out. And Joseph willfully taking upon himself that daily grind to turn it into daily grace. And we can do the same. I'm here to support you as you dare great things for Christ in the ordinary of life. God bless you. Dare great things for Christ. Share your feedback with Father Nathan. Send us an email at info at stjohninstitute.org. That's info at stjohninstitute.org. And don't forget to subscribe to premium video content to form, unite, and inspire you at Eagle Eye Pro on our website, eagleeyeministries.org. That's eagleeyeministries.org.